our next presenters is um, the Saber Analytics team from St. John Fisher College. Uh, for the last five or six years, uh, there's been a Saber Analytics conference in Phoenix in March. And uh, part of the conference is a case competition where uh, different uh, colleges uh, enter teams to um, solve a baseball operations problem. Um, it's ranged from what kind of contract would you offer Mike Trout to sign now, to uh, this year's problem is was developing a season-long plan for a, a pitching utilization for a team of your choice. So um, I'll leave it to them to introduce themselves and um, show you the presentation. They uh, presented this uh, just under a month ago down in uh, Phoenix. And, um, thank you very much. Travis out here. Um, we're representing St. John Fisher College and Coach BL. This is Joey Kircher, Zach Ryan, and Kelly Vanderall. So a little overview of our presentation. We're first going to start with our task that we were given. Um, we're going to go over some data, uh, hit probability chart that we made, some models, the results from our models, um, the usage that we used, and finally our optimal location that we created. A little introduction. Um, so we presented the Diamond Dollar Case Competition in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We presented in front of uh, Major League Baseball front offices. And we have a class, uh, it's called Baseball Ops Challenge. And it's a semester long class, but this case is given to us a week. And we have a week to prepare for this case. So they give it to us, I think, on Wednesday or Tuesday. And Wednesday we go, uh, we have to hand it in by a Tuesday or Wednesday. So we only have a week to do it, but we had about a half a semester to prepare and you know, kind of guess what the case is going to be and kind of be on our toes. So our task is that we um, have an optimal pitching rotation using the opener, um, uh, also the use of a bullpen and how much pitchers are used, and also the non-traditional rosters that they have. So as you can see, um, the trend in baseball is starting to be more relievers are coming in in high leverage situations or even starting games. Um, and that's a trend by the Tampa Bay Rays last year. And also, it's becoming more and more popular. So that was the task that we were given. The approach we used, um, we focused on one single team instead of a league-wide base. We focused on the New York Yankees. Um, this is due to their strong bull bullpen. Um, strong hitters and also they had somewhat a, re a weak starting pitching rotation so we focused on like the strengths of their team. Um, also, like, like I said before, the league trends of the bullpen usage. Um, some assumptions that we had is that in, in order for this to work, the team has to buy into it. Um, the hitters, pitchers, the, uh, the whole organization has to buy into this will work and this can work. So um, that's one assumption. Um, the hit probability that we'll talk uh, a little bit about and that the opening day roster is constant to what we believe it was going to be. Um, so this is the data that we used. We retrieved it from fan graphs. Um, pitchers had a 20 innings pitch minimum. The hitters had a 100 plate appearance minimum. Um, we got our um, stats from Brooks Baseball and also the average versus times through the lineup. So as a hitter sees a pitcher um, more times through the lineup, you're going to assume that um, the average, his batting average is going to go up. All right, um, so to start out, um, we decided to make some statistical models. Um, so one thing we wanted to predict was the runs um, that were going to come. So we ran a correlation matrix to see how the variables kind of move together um, and took into account uh, ones that might be, uh, have like another variable mixed in, so a covariance of them. Um, and this is what we ended up using for our run models. Um, so we have the um, strike percentage, um, average on-base percentage, at-bats, and hits. Um, and then we did the same thing to calculate runs against. Um, so to make our model, we went through the same process. Um, and we used walk percentage, average, left on-base percentage, E minus fifth, and innings pitch. Uh, so here's like a visualization of how we went about creating the models to predict runs against and runs. So basically we want to predict runs against, runs, and hit probability to ultimately create the optimal model lens. So 
here are all the coefficients that, we, that were produced showing significance within the runs against runs model, then going to predicted ones. But as you can see, being closest to zero is obviously the best significance. So for runs against, we ended up having a 0.82 R squared, which is relatively high and shows that that model is, will be able to predict pretty well. Same with the um, runs model that came up to a 0.75 R squared. Um, we know some of these seem a little odd, but like we said, we didn't want to overlap stats, so then the R squares, when we were to overlap them, would end up being like 0.99, which is almost wrong. Like we almost didn't want to do that, because then it's not even, what are you predicting? And you're not predicting anything. So then once we predicted wins with runs against and runs, we came up with a 0.81 R squared. So when we were checking this model, we took the Yankees out of the data and we used 2016, 2017 data to predict the Rays, the Oakland Athletics, and Cleveland Indians. And as you can see, when we predicted them, they're pretty similar. So for the Rays, runs against was projected 701 <coughs> runs when they actually scored 704. Or they, excuse me, they went up 704. For Oakland, they were projected 730 runs when they actually scored 739. Then for the Indians, we projected 105 wins when they actually won 102 games. So now when we implemented the Yankees back into the data, these were what we projected. So runs against was 650 when they actually scored 660, and the wins was 95 and 100. So basically these projections are showing what they would be without the opener. So then once we go to add the usage using hit probability, we want to use runs, runs against, and a weighted hit probability that ultimately came out to an R squared of 0.77. So this is how we calculated hit probability. So basically we said the probability of giving up one hit is the opposite of his average. So for example, at one hit it's 0.7 to the power of three times 300 average with a weight of one. So we could do this for however many batters a um, pitcher is potentially going to face. So this is how we implemented into the rotation later on showing um, the more times a pitcher sees a hitter, his probability of giving, giving up a hit is higher or lower. So then once we implemented this, you can see, so with the usage probability added, the run against goes down uh, a good amount to 643 compared to the actual 660, which without the opener, we projected them giving up 650 rounds. And the biggest one that we really worried about was wins. Um, so basically we projected 103 wins with this new model when they actually won 100 games. But the old projections were showing they actually should have won 95 games, which we kind of based that off of their hitting carries their team a little bit because their pitching isn't going to show as much as the hitting does. So on the optimal rotation, so we went on to uh, fan graphs and we found leverage for each of the Yankees pitchers in 2018. So leverage is just the type of situation that pitchers put in. So a Rolls Chapman is going to have a higher leverage than, say, someone that eats up innings like Chad Green. So we broke these down into three different categories based on their leverage. So we have 0.5 to 0.79 as the quote-unquote opener, the 0.9 to, or 0.8 to 0.99 as the middle reliever, and the 1 and up as the closers. And on the right hand side here, we show that what innings each game those uh, different sets of pitchers would pitch. So we tried to project innings based on their leverage and the appearances that they had in 2017. And one thing that we've noticed from this is that a lot of starters' innings are decreased substantially. This is mostly due in part because we were only limiting them to five innings pitched per game, which necessarily wouldn't hold up. If, say, Sever Luis Severino was pitching a no-hitter after he came in after the second inning, and he could still pitch seven, we'd let him go the extra two innings, and that would give some of the full time guys to rest. So this is just the opening day roster that the Yankees had. We have the 13 opening players, and then we have the next five players that they would call up um, 
they uh, acquired three out of those five through trades in 2018. All right, um, so one thing we wanted to take into consideration was the risk that each pitcher has. Uh, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with like the beta in the stock market, um, but it kind of measures the volatility. So basically it compares it to an index like in the stock market, it's the S&P 500 usually. And then you're seeing how your stock is comparing to that standard and how much it moves compared to how much the standard moves. <coughs> um, so the next slide, um, we did the same thing with um, baseball. So we took the, um, we calculated how much of each of the statistics that are in our model would be needed to generate a win to get them to the postseason um, and broke it down by each game. And then we subbed in each pitcher, like our stock, um, and measured how much they were, like their consistency throughout the entire season. Um, and we repeated this process, process, like I said, for each of the variables that um, were in our models. So uh, when it comes out to it, um, the beta that's greater than one is gonna have a higher risk that they're not gonna meet or exceed the team's average statistic needed to help reach that postseason. And a beta less than one is gonna be less risky that they're not gonna <coughs> reach that team average, so we predict that they will most likely be meeting um, the average that we've seen So, in finding what we decided, we looked at uh, the four game series that they had. They were opening 2018 against the Blue Jays up in Toronto. So this is what we <coughs> thought that they should do. We put some of their more risky pitchers with some of their less risky pitchers in the game. So, we started out with Ed Warren, who's considered one of the more risky relievers they have as an opener, and then bring in Luis Severino to throw three through however many, and then we can end up with Chad Green or David Robertson or both, but we don't have to. So the end of the game is more of a field situation. It's not necessarily a set in stone, so you're not necessarily bringing in both players or even one if Luis Severino is playing well. And same thing for game two. And then we recognize in game three and four, we still have Chad Green, David Robertson, Dylan Batances, and Rose Chapman as the four late inning relievers. Um, like I said before, their role is not really set in stone. It's more of a feel situation for the manager and how the other pitchers are pitching. So there's a couple long-term implications that we thought of when thinking about how the opener would impact the league and teams. So. One major concern throughout the league and players is that pitcher values are going to go down, like starting pitcher values, but like a Blake Snell type player and reliever values are going to go up more. Um, one thing in the game that they're trying to fix right now is runs and substituting more pitchers in the games would ideally lead to less runs overall, which would make it less exciting for an average fan. More pitching changes, which adds more time to the game, which they are currently trying very, very hard to cut down on. And like I said, pace of play, it's going to add a substantial more time because they take one guy out after facing one guy, one hitter, and you go into a commercial break, last three minutes, and then go back and you're still warming up on the mound. And then, like the average fan doesn't like, it's gonna fundamentally change baseball if they start doing this. Um, so, yeah. Any questions? Are you contacted the Yankee management about this? Uh, <laughs> they need all the help they can get. <laughs> no, they don't need any help. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think Aaron Boone has another control. He told us, so we're here if he needs us. Oh, it's one of these rule changes and how it's going to impact some of these positions. I was talking about having pitchers have to come in and face three years. You know, and that the needs to be removed. I mean, what impact is that going to have on take on your statistics? So, kind of what we looked at is we broke it down as players would pitch like the full inning. So, we weren't even looking at them as a uh, one on one guy. So, you think about a like, chase and shreve, he's not going to come in and face one guy, he's going to come and face ideally a whole inning. Mm -hmm. So three, four batters. I think the uh, MLB is kind of in a tough spot because along with the rest of us, you didn't think that 
this analytical process would be coming about us so quickly and um, becoming basically taking over baseball. So I think MLB is trying to catch up and like fix some mistakes or fix some leak trends that might not be going in their favor. So I think that they're trying to play a little catch up and try and do um, make up the some maybe not mistakes call it, but also try to play in advance to try to make the game quicker and more fans to watch as well. It, it would limit some of the strategy as opposed to replacing it with skill. <laughs> you see that sort of with the, the shift too. There, there's talk yes. about oh, you know, going away with the shift, this and that. But, you know, some of some of us think you know, become better hitters instead of away from the shift, or you know, down the line. You know, what I mean? right? <laughs> but especially with the Yankees, you know, I'm, I'm a Yankees fan. You, you, you see, put the shift down, like, just one down the line. But some players, you know, some players can't. They rather try to hit the long ball. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in Arizona, what type of feedback or questions did you get from the MLB staff that was here for the presentation? So one was more about the weighted. They they're kind of confused on what the weighted average did. Um, Oh, and then the other one was, how can you project? They questioned the uh, any projection on how the starters are going to drop so much and how you're going to put, like, say. Because Louis Severino pitched in 2018, he pitched like 190 innings. We, yeah. in our projection, we had him pitching like 130 or something like that. Yeah. And then they had like the, mid, the traditional mid relievers would be throwing way more innings. Yeah, they'd be throwing like 20, 30 more innings. But that was like a common thread. Tech, uh, so I had a question about that too because the thing that stuck out to me was you <coughs> gave Chapman about a third more innings than he actually pitched. So how does your model take into account? You have to assume if he's going to pitch that much more during a year. Does your model assume the same level of effectiveness or does it build in a likely decline in effectiveness if you're going to use him so much? Yeah, it was the same throughout. Um, and then one thing we also wanted to implement that we didn't have time to was we were actually going to try to project like injuries and injury prevention, but the, in a week's time that just wasn't enough. Yeah, that. One of the uh, how did how does uh, Nate mentioned it too? Like the statistics vary based on the ballpark they're playing. How does that affect your like the ballpark factor? Uh, the ballpark factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that well, wasn't really implemented because it was based off of the 2018 data, so theoretically it was already implemented into those statistics. Where if we're projecting in 2019, like, or 2020, then we would have had to implement them. We also played in consideration that, like we said, the Yankee starters are even, like, top-notch, that if you try to Reducing their ratings for <laughs> older guys like CC and uh, Tanaka, reducing their ratings would also reduce coming to injury, which will hopefully help us down, the line, help them down the line, come playoffs and stuff, and really grind like grind time to win games before the playoffs, which would make the final push. We also put that in consideration, but you could also say on the other hand that our relievers are pitching more innings. Like, will that affect their injuries as well? Which is, as we said, we couldn't didn't really have enough time to do So. If you had a team that had a significantly worse bullpen, which the Yankees were probably one of the best bullpens last year, how does, did you run or thought about running something like maybe one of their, the worst bullpens in baseball and how this would have an impact? So we did, we projected these for all of them, and it was pretty similar to where it, the new usage rate, like,
help them create more wins and less runs against them. Because if you look at it, the Indians, per se, they probably have one of the best starting pitching rotations in baseball. And they ideally lack a bullpen. So just seeing that it's going to improve, it might not improve everyone, so it might not be ideal for each team to implement, but we would say, just looking at the Yankees, they should. A couple teams in Phoenix also um, looked at teams that really weren't in the playoff run that had the worst bullpens. And um, typically you can say sometimes that the worst bullpen you had usually, because bullpen's really important, especially now that like the worst of the team you'll have. And they're looking at teams that, um, that are probably 30 games out of the race in the playoff time. They're like, oh, this will increase their wins by like one or two wins. And we're, we're sitting there kind of going like, one or two wins is going to give them the playoff hunt. So, you know, so yeah, they like, looked at it like the Marlins. Mm -hmm. And it was going to increase them by one win. Like, what's that doing for the Marlins? Right. That's doing absolutely nothing. It's not going to put them in the playoffs. Yeah, so basically, like, we're not saying for all teams, but usually the worst your bullpen is not, like, you see in the playoffs that um, Clayton, Clayton Kershaw will come in and he'll pitch in key spots in the game because maybe they're lacking a bullpen or, you know, other teams. Chris Sale last year. Right, yeah. Come so in. typically in the regular season, the worst your um, bullpen is, and you're going to lose tighter games because, you know. We used the opener last year in Rochester. Did you? The Twins started implementing it, so then they wanted me to keep track of what our team ERA was separate from the traditional ball. The problem is if, you're, if your opener has a bad outing, and he's only pitching one and two innings, that's hard. That The traditional numbers are hard to get to normalize because you need a lot more data. So if we, we used the opener, I think, 14 times last year. And our team ERA was lower, but the opener's ERA was much higher because we had two different instances where the opener gave up three runs in the first inning. So that's hard. I mean, that with limited innings, it's hard to get that number to go down. But it's clear that it, it worked the way that the Twins hoped it would work. Plus, they, if they're going to do it in the big leagues, they have to experience it in the minors, or they should experience it in the minors before they get to the big leagues. So yeah. that's, that's another thing we kind of looked at. Like, say if you start an Adam Warren, and you hope that he goes too scoreless, but what if he gives up four runs? Are you still going to come in with Severino down four right. in like the third inning? You know what I mean? Which so then throws off game two or game three right. if you have projected. Oh, sure. Strong. One sure. thing that we looked at, though, is we also had a fifth starter not included in that four game series that we could just throw to get up innings too. Did did you guys look at the potential being because of their bullpen depth, not having the starter throw as much and not having to throw every five days, but maybe he's throwing every four days? Based on numbers of number of pitches? It's definitely consideration based on not even <coughs> sometimes number of pitches, just innings. Um, so if he goes four innings one day and then say he might be fresh for four games uh, next in four games and then he might be able to throw seven. Um, we didn't necessarily look at that. We limited it specifically just to five innings just to keep it because I think the in the case study it said that the Cleveland Indians average start was like six and a third innings. So we just figured about five innings is going to be about the average for a start. We also figured like this rotation with the starting pitchers coming in later in the games, they'll throw off their like routine, which isn't necessarily bad come playoff time because you need to so have Severino or Tanaka start game one. Like they might need to come in game four or like you know sooner than that. So short days of rest isn't necessarily bad um, to get them ready for the playoffs and endurance. Maybe not early on in the season, but you know, towards the middle, towards the end of the season. Like a couple of years ago, Severino didn't get out of the first inning, the wild card game, and Robinson and Chad Green Chad and Green. Dave Robinson both had to come in and throw a ton of a ton of innings to get yeah. him through the game. You would hope that that's not their first experience right. with that in well, a wild postseason game. Used to be a former starting pitcher, so that helped. Um, sure. Yeah, we faced him a bunch. Is <laughs> that the game where Severino showed up about a half hour before game time? No, that was the yeah. the Walker game against the Twins. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that was last year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But well, thank you guys very thank much. You. Thank you.
Thank you.